The flight of the Apollo 13 to the moon is in serious jeopardy this morning and is not going to make a moon landing. As the Apollo 13 was some 205,000 miles from Earth, speeding toward its rendezvous with the moon scheduled for tomorrow night, the fuel cells that supply it with electrical power suddenly failed. With this lack of power, the mission could not be completed to the moon, and it is now a question of getting the men home safely. That can be done with the use of the descent propulsion system engine of the lunar landing craft itself, which of course is now attached to the nose of the command module. Uh, but that uh, will be a first, of course, in space, and this is indeed the gravest emergency probably yet in the American space program. The whole circumstance uh, began unfolding at around 10 o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time some three hours ago when Jim Lovell, the commander of the Apollo 13 uh, command module Odyssey, reported back uh, to the Mission Control Center in Houston that uh, the fuel cells were draining rapidly of their power. They have three fuel cells, and one and three went out almost immediately, and two began draining rapidly. They was try to conserve some of the power in that uh, fuel cell. They shut down all power and went on the battery power in the lunar module landing craft, uh, Aquarius. We can hear the Astros now as they are talking to Houston at this moment, and let's listen in. So when you can see some stars, if you can, I think you can recognize them and recognize constellations, uh, please let us know. Okay, we'll check. Goodbye. Participants in the forthcoming press conference uh, within the next 15 minutes or so will be uh, Man Spacecraft Center Deputy Director Christopher C. Kraft, Jr., Apollo Spacecraft Program Office Manager James A. McDivitt and MSC Director of Flight Operations Sigurd Schoberg. This will be in the small briefing room in the Houston News Center. We'll be isolated from the air ground, which will be continually fed uh, in real time to the News Center. is one of attitude and guidance in the uh, spacecraft. Uh, the, with the power down, I gather Wally Sharoff, who was with me, uh, they are not able to uh, determine their exact attitude uh, through their instruments, and uh, therefore they have said they are navigating by simply uh, uh, viewing out of the window uh, the Terminator, the sun line on the moon. That's one of the things I did read, Walter. Now, you must realize we're all trained to look at the star pattern, the celestial sphere as we call it, to determine which star is a navigation star. We have 37 stars that are part of our computer program. They can be picked up out of the window and that's part of what you heard in this last transmission. So a, a crude attitude can be obtained initially with the stars. Then we have a, a device in the vehicle, be it the LEM or the command module, in this case of course they're using the LEM, to look at a known star. And that data can be transferred from a little optical site, kind of fun, I developed that back in Mercury days, uh, to determine their attitude celestially, which is the inertial attitude we talk about. Now, if the LEM computer works properly, they can attach uh, the same star by moving the LEM, the whole combination, the LEM service module, command module, with the LEM propulsion system attitude control to get a fix. Now, the reason that they need that attitude so precisely is to fire the engines. Yes. Uh, they have to be fired with them in the right attitude, or, of course, the thrust is in the wrong direction. Yeah. They go off in the wrong now, direction. Now, this is all within the capability of the computer program. Uh, it's really, and, and I guess they simply said you can talk to the LEM computer uh, through uh, any variable, much as the this optical alignment site, we call it the COAS, which is just a collimating device. But now there again, uh, using that computer is draining some of that precious power that they're From the taking off that's, the battery. That's correct. Now what they'll do is, uh, one of the things I read... Uh, uh, excuse me, Wally, say? Roy Neal has been in mission control. Let's listen in. Good. Mission control in Houston are gathered around the console. 
They are talking at the moment through the capsule communicator Jack Lausma with astronauts James Lovell and Fred Hayes in Aquarius, the lunar module, which is in control of the situation, moving toward the moon. Jack Swaggart is in the command module. That module, Odyssey, currently powered down, having suffered trouble in two out of the three fuel cells, trouble sufficient to abort the mission of Apollo 13 to the moon and force a return to Earth. A return, however, that will not begin until the lunar module engines are fired up to accelerate the spacecraft, speed it up so that it will go around the moon and then return to Earth. Uh, that burn is expected in about uh, 20 hours and a half, about 20 and a half hours from now. And this means that the astronauts will be returning to Earth a good deal earlier than expected at 142 hours into the mission, 142 hours after they took off. Right now, aboard the spacecraft, the men are setting power levels. Here at Mission Control, the various support sections are figuring out at what power levels they can operate. The computers are being checked and aligned. The astronauts are looking out the window, checking stars. And that's the situation right now. To repeat, Apollo 13 will not land on the moon. Instead, engines will be burned aboard the lunar module some 20 and a half hours from now to send it on its way back to Earth. Roy Neal in Mission Control. Back here at our CBS News Space Center in New York, and Wally Sharon, I might show you what has transpired here this evening. This is the configuration uh, that the uh, spacecraft have been in uh, since Saturday afternoon when they docked after the very successful takeoff from uh, Merritt Island, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, uh, with the command module here and the lunar modules here. Uh, what has happened tonight is that the uh, that the service module uh, has the uh, three fuel cells in it that supply fuel basically uh, to the command module for the flight out and back. It is the service module that is jettisoned just before the command module makes its re-entry uh, when it comes back to Earth. And all of the power supply and uh, life support and environmental equipment basically for long trips out to space are here. Uh, the uh, the now, this engine is the service propulsion system engine, 20,500 pounds of thrust. It is that engine which uh, is depended upon to boost uh, all of this configuration, first into the lunar orbit and then out of lunar orbit back home. Without that engine, presumably, they couldn't come back, except, of course, that they do have the lunar modules here below. Uh, now, normally, these would be detached, of course, make the lunar landing, and once they have made the lunar landing, the uh, top section of this, the ascent stage, comes back and rejoins, then this is jettisoned, and the service propulsion system is left to bring them home. However, with them still attached, as they are now, uh, they can use the descent propulsion system engine, which is here. The reason they can use this, when they are, whereas they cannot use the service propulsion system engine, is that this operates on batteries. It has its own battery supply, not fuel cells. In other words, it doesn't generate electricity. It simply uses it in a storage battery, just like in your automobile, as opposed to the fuel cells, which generate electricity. So with those batteries, they've got just a limited amount of electrical power. But that is enough power, and this engine, which runs from 1,050 to 9,500 pounds of thrust, is throttleable, as so-called, is capable of taking the whole shebang here out of lunar orbit and send it on the way back home. Now, they don't have any backup system anymore. That is the backup system. That's the one that they would have used if the solar propulsion system engine had gone out uh, uh, while they were still in lunar orbit and before they were detached from this. Now they can use it to come home, and that's what they're going to have to do. The maneuvers will be then, first of all, to get lined up, as we were talking about a moment ago, uh, without uh, perhaps uh, some, of the, uh, uh, some of the computer help that they would have normally have, but with the star sites that uh, Wally was just telling us about, they will get lined up uh, as accurately as they can, and it must be quite accurate. Uh, then they will fire this engine down here at the bottom uh, to speed them up. By speeding them up, the moon doesn't catch them in quite the same orbit uh, it would have normally, and, uh, and it, in, in effect, reestablishes what is called a free return trajectory. In other words, it speeds them up enough so that the moon just catches them with its gravity and throws them around in a slingshot maneuver, but just precisely if this firing is correct, so that they will return to Earth. 
then perhaps they will need another firing of this engine on the way back to Earth to line up exactly for their landing on the scheduled spot in the Pacific. But at any rate, that's what is being planned right now. There is no further thought of possibly going to the moon, unless by some miracle, I suppose, those uh, fuel cells came back on the line, but that's not even in the, in the books, is it? No, I wouldn't anticipate that. The, uh, once the fuel cells are gone, they're, they're almost irretrievable. The, uh, the one consoling thing, at least the last I've heard, is that the third fuel cell, which is number two in essence, uh, is available on the line, but they've conserved it. You can use the fuel cell to recharge the batteries in the command module, which is significant in that that itself can fly a reentry without the service module, and does normally. Yeah.